When you build a hugel culture bed, plant your seeds in it immediately. So here's a picture of me. I'm planting the seeds in this hugel culture immediately. Because, <laughs> you know, I'm good like that, right? Next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a, an urban lot with hugel culture in a backyard in Missoula. In Missoula, the topsoil is about uh, half an inch thick. And then there's a bunch of rocks, you know, because we've, we've, you know, we've, we've taken that Lake Missoula thing and over and over again, we took all of our soil and gave it to the rest of the Pacific Northwest. The only way you can get a lovely garden is, is if you build a raised bed and you, you do something nice and tall. So, so this is cottonwood. We were very fortunate. Everything in here was cottonwood. But this was also something, um, and I'm doing a thing in here which I, I later learned was a bad thing, and, and then I would chastise other people about doing this. But you can see that there's like ornamental sticks sticking out of the top. Like, oh yeah, we'll just, we'll just leave those there, and then like, you know, plant some pole beans and stuff, and they'll kind of go up that, it'll be real cool. <laughs> Instead what happens is, is that the wood kind of wicks the water out of the hookah culture and then dries it. So it dries out your hugel culture bed. It's less than optimal. So don't leave little decorative sticks sticking out of the top. Next slide, please. Mark Vandermeer, he's a forester. And uh, in this particular case, uh, we got a video and it's like everything in this area is brown and dormant, except for this one green patch. And, and the story is, is that he said, well, I had this job once and we dropped a lot of spruce and it was in the back of my truck and I needed to get rid of it because we needed the truck to go do something else. So we just threw the spruce onto the ground. And then two years later, uh, I had a bunch of dirt in the back of my truck from a project, but we needed the truck for something else. So we just took all the dirt out. We didn't have any place to put it, so we just threw it on top of that spruce. And the next spring we were working on this project and we had a bunch of these plants and pots in the back of the truck, but we needed the truck for something else. So we just stuck them on top of that dirt and we forgot about it. And now it's three years later and those were all riparian loving, the riparian species trees and, and stuff. And, and this thing is just thick with a bunch of riparian species uh, of trees and he has not watered it. So when I first started talking about hugel culture, people were like, you're lying to us. And so I provided this video as evidence of how well it works. So then we moved on to the big guns. And so this is in Dayton, Montana. And um, uh, this is uh, uh, May, early May of 2012. And Sepp Holzer did this. And you can see the, these hugel culture beds are about six feet tall. And Sepp has a technique where he likes to pin the mulch onto the sides of the hugel culture beds. Um, he makes, a, he gets a branch with a fork in it, and then he, he cuts one uh, part of the branch to be short, and he calls what's left a nail. And then he'll shove that into the hugel culture to hold up these, uh, these uh, horizontal pieces of wood, which are then holding up all of the little sticks that are basically his idea of mulch. Next slide, please. Uh, there he is, the mighty, the glorious, the amazing Sepp Holzer. And he's uh, doing some of this mulching himself. Next slide, please. So there's, there's some more of it. He built nearly a kilometer of hugel culture beds. Next slide, please. And this gal's not all that tall. So some of the, some of the hugel culture beds were taller than others. I would guess that this hugel culture bed is currently about five feet. And you can also see he's using a different mulching technique on this one. So there's straw, but he's still trying to pin it up. And you can kind of see, here's one of the pins right here. Here's one of his nails. Next slide, please. So this is uh, September. Now, that was never irrigated. Everything there was planted uh, early May, and there were frosts afterwards, and there was no rain for three weeks. And so there's a lot of worry that everything germinated, got this big, and then died. And, and Sep, people kept asking about that, like, we're planting things that hate frost, and there's going to be more frost. And Sep said, have a little more faith in nature. No irrigation, and I think that those are recognizable plants, and I think that a frost has already hit. You can kind of tell in these squash leaves, it looks like frost damage to me. Um, and I can recognize, I can see some lettuce in there. 
Um, there might possibly, if you look really hard, you might see a pumpkin. <laughs> Next slide, please. That guy is six foot three. That gives you an idea of how big the beds are. And these, and the hula culture beds are gonna settle a little bit. Um, I think that looks like a, uh, a sunflower. I could be wrong. <laughs> Anybody recognize this? Jerusalem artichokes, also known as, sun, as sunchokes, sometimes called fartichokes. <laughs> Highest calorie per acre. However, that last name kind of gives you an idea why not everybody is keen on growing it. However, uh, it's, it's perennial, and it, it, a lot of people put it at the top of their hookah culture beds because uh, sunchokes are just a glutton for punishment, and so that's the driest part of the hookah culture bed, and sunchokes are like, I don't, I don't care. That's fine. <laughs> Try to kill me. <laughs> but in fact, a lot of survivalists will, will plant just tons and tons of sunchokes. It might make you fart a lot, but you know, you won't die. Because the other thing is you can harvest it all year long, right from the soil. February, January, go out there, dig some up. You don't have to bring it in. If you don't want any, just leave it out there. Tell you want some. No problem. Alright, this this slide. Is, is of that location, and, and you know, you can see a lot of greenery, but look, look at the background. Look how you look right down in there, and you can kind of see these hills in the background. Now this is 2012. Um, uh, where we were, we had two months solid of forest fires. Everywhere was like smoky, 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 smoky. And mysteriously, on this day that I traveled out to Dayton to take this video, um, there was no smoke. Well, you can kind of see a little bit in the background, a little bit, but it was like most of, I mean, it was, it was like you couldn't breathe. Everybody was hunkered down in their house, uh, nestled up to an air cleaner. And, and it's like, you just don't go outside because it's just way too smoky. So, uh, so we just, you know, we scheduled it, we went, uh, and, and it's like, it just turned clear. It was, it was crazy. And then the next day it was smoky again. But this was, and it, the reason why there's so many forest fires, it was so dry that year. So very, very, very dry. And this stuff was not irrigated. None of this stuff was irrigated. And look at how great it's done. Look how green and lush this is. And we're gonna talk about how and why in a little bit. But I just wanted to, to emphasize, everything in the area was brown and dormant while this was green and lush and full of food. Next slide, please. Uh, this, I think, was taken the next year, so this would be 2013, from an airplane, and you can kind of see the, the hookah culture beds. Now, um, when I first met Sepp in 2009, um, I presented him with some of my ideas. I thought my ideas were great. And at the time, Sepp's designs were to always make your hookah culture beds very straight, and they need to be perpendicular to the most common path of the wind. So that way, the, the wind passes over the hugel culture instead of between the rows. So I came to him with this idea of saying, how about if you set the hugel cultures up so they're generally going up and down the hill, so they're, they're opposite of being on contour, they're going up and down, the hill, but they kind of have little curves in them, so no matter which way the wind's blowing, it won't be able to get in between the hugel culture beds. And it turns out that while Sepp didn't speak a lick of English, and I didn't speak a lick of German, he had one word that, that he did know in, in English, and, and it turned out on this particular visit, he shared this word with me over and over again. Catastrophe! <laughs> I, I don't know why he thought it was a catastrophe, and if he didn't want to talk about something, he always did this. So we're not going to talk about that anymore. <laughs> I said catastrophe, and that's all there is. So then, then his book comes out, and it turns out he changed his mind on that straight line thing. I believe that I changed the mind of Sepp Holzer. And here's the evidence. Those are kind of curvy, aren't they? All right, that's, that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> all right, this is from uh, our my three DVD set, um, uh, it's I, I went down to teach an Earthworks workshop down in San Diego, and there was a guy down there with a bunch of, a couple of guys with, with cameras, and they hooked me up with all the sound gear, and they're gonna, 
They're saying, we're going to do a Kickstarter. We're going to get rich. And I'm like, that's great. More wealth to you. Have a good time. Uh, just so you know, I don't need any money. I just hope you guys get really rich and stuff like that. All right. So I did the whole workshop. And um, then the guy that hired the videographers and the videographers had some sort of falling out. And three months later, the guy that brought me in is handing me all this video footage and asking me to make a DVD set. So we did. We, we converted, we call it World Domination Gardening. And it's just that one workshop. Although, as we're doing the video, we decided to um, do the entire workshop again, but at my place in Montana. And so uh, the three DVD set has the same workshop um, twice, and, and once in a warm climate, San Diego, and once in a cold climate, Montana. At this particular site, one of the things that we did uh, for this Earthworks workshop <clears throat> is they do get some frost there, and uh, at the same time, in the summertime, it gets freakishly hot. And so uh, we wanted to make some spots that were much, much cooler in the summertime, as well as some spots that were much, much warmer in the uh, wintertime. And uh, I believe that we, we, we shaped their hugel culture here into a sun scoop facing south, and I think that they're growing a macadamia tree in the middle of it. Okay, uh, any other questions about hugel culture? What about using dimensional lumber like if you tear down, tear down the corn? I would say that uh, dimensional lumber is okay. I, I would choose to not use anything that has paint on it. Definitely don't use anything that's treated. But a lot of old barns, it's like, you know, they, they weren't painted with anything and a lot of the wood inside is, you know, pine or uh, uh, spruce or something like that. Uh, that would be fine. I mean, I think I would rather use it for fuel and a rocket mass heater. And usually that's why it's like, Okay, um, wood. First, can I build something out of the log? Next, can I run it through the sawmill? Uh, you know, next, can I use it in a rocket mass heater? And then, finally, hugel culture. So, um, but I would say that that dimensional number, you know, might be useful for a lot of other things. But yeah, I, I think most of it can be used in hugel culture. Yeah, there was one over here. She's got two questions and she's trying to speak them both in at once. How about if I let you have a second part here in a moment? I'll, I'll call on you next. Let me, let me do the first question first. So, so she's, she's asking, um, so her son does it in a way. There he is, right there. Are you ready for your public shaming? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mom. My son did it this other way. Can you explain why your way is better? That, that's the question. So I'm trying to build it up six feet tall, and your son dug a ditch three feet deep and put the wood down in there and then made a three foot tall hugel culture on top of that. So it's still sort of, kind of, six feet tall. And, and, now, and now I've got to point out why that technique is stupid. <laughs> Poor guy. Man, mom! <laughs> Okay, um, actually I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to this in a, in a little bit. I was going to get to this in a little bit, but, but I'm going to go ahead and cover it right now. Part of what we want to do is add texture to the landscape. And you know what, I am going to save this for later because I've got some images that are, are going to really help. But let's keep in mind, I'm going to wait for the images. Now you're, you had a, a second question. And what was, I, I, I thought I could remember the second question, but go ahead and ask the second question. What, what kind of plants do you plant going up the hill? That's a great question. And, and so um, what's gonna happen is, is that uh, as all the water lands on top of this, the top part of the hula culture is gonna end up really dry. And then the water's gonna run down the sides a lot. I mean, a lot of it's gonna go inside and fill all those woody bits with lots and lots of water. But of course, there's more woody bits at the bottom. So there's more watery bits at the bottom. And then um, uh, just the water that happens around the outside, there ends up being a lot more water down at the foot of the hugel culture bed than at the top. So what's gonna happen is that your stuff that likes dry feet are gonna be at the top. And the most common one, of course, what we already saw is sun chokes. And then towards the bottom are gonna be your swamp-loving plants like onions. So, and then of course in between, you're gonna have strawberries and all kinds of other things. And, and then plus, 
you know, the other thing is, is you know, the next slide is polyculture, and so this might not be a bad time to kind of touch into that a little bit. But it's like, I, I want to just do a, a to, to answer your question, I'm going to uh, uh, talk a little bit about what is the difference between organic gardening and permaculture gardening. So in organic gardening, you're going to, let's say, raise a row of potatoes, not in a polyculture, just a row of nothing but the exact same variety of potatoes. And you go out one day, and it's all flat because you use your road tiller. By the way, every time you till the ground, you lose 30% of your organic matter. And as I'm sure all of you know, organic matter is like the magic stuff in your soil that makes it really hold water well. And we are talking about replacing irrigation permaculture. In fact, just a, just a quick note, I, I, use, I wrote a, a lawn care article decades ago, three decades ago, wow, has it been that long? And I, I wrote that article and um, there are lawns in Missoula that are green all year and they never irrigate. And it's entirely because there's so much organic matter in the soil. So that's a way, and that's a way that's not even mentioned in this presentation. Colorado potato beetles come and they land and you, you go out one day and you're looking at your potatoes and uh, <gasps> I see a Colorado potato beetle. And it's like, okay, if you're a conventional gardener or a conventional farmer, then of course your first thought is that I'm going to hire a really tiny mafia to come out with little teeny tiny machine guns and kill all those Colorado potato beetles before they reproduce and kill my entire crop. But you don't have that. So it's like, okay, I'm going to bring out some kind of chemical that's gonna poison them all. But you know, not poison my potatoes, hopefully. And, and then it's like, but wait, wait, oh, I'm an organic gardener. I need OMRI certified poison. All the poison, but apparently it's like naturally occurring. So naturally occurring poison kills you just as good as unnaturally occurring poison. Um, all right, so organic in many ways is just as bad as conventional. Now, um, uh, so if you go out there and it's like, okay, I see the Colorado potato beetle, you're kind of thinking like, okay, I gotta get rid of the Colorado potato beetles to really wipe out my crop. Now, if you're a gardener, one of your options is, I will smash them, smash, smash. And then if you're a farmer and you got like 40 acres, the smash technique will not work. You will smash all of them down one row, and then while you're doing that, they will destroy your entire crop and then sneak up behind you up that row while you're smashing them. So then it's like, okay, I gotta, I gotta poison them. There's no other way. Now, a permaculture gardener is gonna be a little bit different. You come out and you see your potato plant and it's got Colorado potato beetle on it. And it's like, <laughs> that plant's gonna die. <laughs> I'm going inside. <laughs> Now you got lots of other potato plants, but the thing is, is that that potato plant is growing in a condition where it's not very good. In fact, that Colorado potato beetle works for Mother Nature. And as permaculturists, we're trying to work with nature instead of work against nature. And this is an agent of nature. So basically, Mother Nature looks to that permaculturalist and says, okay, look, see this plant right here? The pH is off here. This potato can't tolerate that. So here's, here's what I'm gonna do. Don't worry, I'll fix it, okay? You just go inside, I'll take care of it. I got some uh, Colorado potato beetles. I'm gonna deploy them here. They're gonna eat all that. And look, right next to it, see that? That's something else that loves this spot. Once the potato plant is gone, that thing will do awesome here. In the meantime, you've got a whole bunch of other potato plants growing all over the place but they're in good spots. The spot that they're in has a whole different pH going on. In your row or in your field, the pH is pretty much all the same. The amount of water they're getting, the amount of nutrients they're getting is all homogenous. It's all about the same. But with all of this edge and texture in the landscape, and you've got these six and seven foot tall hugelkultur beds that are not buried in the ground, 
You've got all kinds of variety. You've got spots that are facing north and south, spots that are facing east or west. You've got spots that are damp and spots that are dry. You've got spots with a high pH and spots with a low pH. You've got spots with all kinds of different NPK. You've got a recipe for diversity. All these plants can mingle their roots together. And each spot is slightly different from the next. So you can have all kinds of different places. And so that's the big difference. Now, we talked about the hookah culture bed that was, oh, you said what plants to plant. That was the question. And so you plant them all, all over the place. Good luck, seeds, you're on your own. Hope it works out for you. <laughs> So he got a bunch of video of Sep, and he's got a big bucket of seeds, and he reaches into the bucket, and he gets a handful of seeds, and he flings it. And he uses this technique called fling and kick and stomp, and fling and kick and stomp. It's kind of dancey, but it works. It's a mix of seeds. Good luck. Good luck. I hope it all works out. Whatever you do, there's lots of diversity here. You guys fight it out for the good spots. And it works out. When you know sunflowers are in a spot that's good for sunflowers, they do great. When sunflowers are in a spot that's terrible for sunflowers, they don't do great. And something else does. And then the sunflower that was there dies. And something else is great. So much less stress. Colorado Petermeal comes. <laughs> You're gonna die. That's it. That's the end of it. That's the stress. I didn't squish a single Colorado peanut beetle. It's like, that's an agent of nature. I'm working with her. She's doing my bidding, sort of, kind of, a little bit. Um, I'm romancing nature. Okay, over here, there was a question over here somewhere. Yes? I just have one last. We talked about deer, and I have a schizoid dog, but what about burrowing animals and then people culture? Is it any more of a couple or Okay, all right, all right. Great question. What about burrowing animals? And as long as we're talking about burrowing animals, let's talk about um, carpenter ants. And, uh, and then when we're down in the south, we're going to talk about termites. And um, what about, what about uh, all the other animals? What about all the wildlife that just moves in and turns it into a nightmare? Uh, like Alfred Hitchcock would think it was funny. Um, so, and, and it's kind of like, so it's, it's true. When you build uh, a, a, a brand new hookah culture bed, uh, you're going to have this big influx of stuff you don't want, and then the uh, predators for that stuff are going to show up this through the way down, and then it's going to go out and then it's going to go down, and eventually it's going to level out. So, out at our place, we built some uh, really tall hugo culture beds, and um, uh, I think it was a year and a half ago we had we had chipmunks. It's like every time you'd go by, it's like the whole thing is alive with chipmunks. <laughs> There's got to be like 30 of them. Whenever you walk like 10 paces down, and here's a whole other bunch of them all coming to life, and they don't move out. <laughs> then, and then suddenly the population dropped. Like, like in a week, it went down to like hardly any. And then we found, um, near one of the paths, we found a dead stoat with a hole in it. And so pretty sure it was the chipmunk mafia did a hit <laughs> on that stoat. Um, Drive-by shooting, maybe. Uh, and then I, I think a couple of feral cats moved in and wiped out. So this last summer, I, don't, I saw, I don't remember seeing a single chipmunk. Um, so some snakes. Sometimes remember Steve the snake, and that guy's a problem solver. <laughs> yeah, we call him the wolf, right? <laughs> Steve. Uh, so usually these problems kind of come and go in cycles. But deer, <laughs> the deer and turkeys, you know, fences for that. But the little guys, the predators will... Sepp Holter has a great thing that he does, is like whenever he gets too many of those burrowing kind of animals and they're eating his stuff, he uh, actually takes his compost out there and dumps his compost just right on the ground, stink and all. And it's like, well, doesn't that attract more of them? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it, it also attracts their predators. Ah, they're thinking... So then they get the idea of like, oh look, chipmunk buffet. And that has two different meanings. <laughs> <laughs>
So um, I, I, I'd say that the number one ingredient is patience. Just, I mean, a lot of permaculture stuff is like the, the, the answer to the question is, is to be even lazier. All right, oh, right here. I just have a kind of general question. Um, so like being able to, you know, grow enough of a particular crop to be able to can it or freeze it or whatever for the winter. And it feels like the two are, like they're opposite concepts, you know, traditional gardening, if you will, where you grow a whole bunch of something in one area so that you can have enough to harvest, and having in polyculture where you're going to have a couple of bean plants here and a couple over here and a couple over here. Do you have any sense of how to work all that out? Yes. <laughs> all right. When when we do this kind of when we do polyculture, the question is is like. Um, I want to be able to make the harvest. I mean, right now the harvest is pretty quick and easy. And so a so couple of things. One is, is that when we have big culture beds, it used to be that when you got the flat system, you're like, ah, it's come to me, strawberry. Ah, ah, I got one. <laughs> so now you got this culture bed, and you're like, hello, strawberry, come to me. It was much easier. So you're not bending down as much, but all right. The harvest is gonna take twice as long because you're right, it's all spread all over the place willy-nilly. However, we did save you from having to irrigate, fertilize, do pest control. Um, and a lot of times when you get really good at this, we even saved you from planting any seeds. So um, there, basically it's like the, the, there's, we, we already saved you a bunch of time but we did pretty much double the harvest time now if it's just you by yourself and all you're doing is eating it fresh and you're not canning it at all then it's like big deal it, the harvest time is really about the same but I think most of us in this room are going to try and preserve the harvest and for yourself and sometimes it's like going to make a market garden with the excess and so in which case it's like it's really convenient like today I'm going to do uh, strawberry jam and so I, I need more than a basket of strawberries. I need like, you know, I'd like to get five buckets and, and make a big batch of strawberry jam. And each day I'm gonna do five buckets until, you know, the, the, the season is basically over. So um, they're gonna be spread out. It's gonna take more time to harvest, no doubt. Um, it's the trade. Um, I'm, I'm, I kind of feel like I'm not answering your question. I'm just validating that it's frustrating. <laughs> yeah, I'll validate that. You know, how, how many people here are familiar with the Wheaton Eco Scale? None? No. Three. Three four. Okay. That, that makes me kind of sad. <laughs> There's a lot of people who are like, I'm going to do permaculture, and I'm going to raise a market garden and sell the food or, or something like that. And, and so often people go down a path and it's like they, they raise one, two, or three crops. And it's like, no, 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 that's, that's not the permaculture. Uh, the permaculture way is gonna be feed yourself first. And so um, you're saying like, okay, you could do that. You can have your own little personal garden for eat, feeding yourself and things like that. And then you're saying like, but over there we're gonna have a market garden, which is gonna be the rose, perhaps. I shouldn't have and, used and the term market garden. On no, no, I'm I'm with you. Okay. I get you. What you want is a place where it's like, I'm going to gather up a whole bunch of food before going into the market today to sell the food, and and it's like, you get up at three o'clock in the morning and you're picking all this food, and and it's like, oh, I do not want to get up at midnight instead to sell the same food. And I wish to um, paint a whole different picture and, and go down a different path. But the, the thing is, first feed yourself. Next, do that same system over and over and over again, which means polyculture, which means that it's gonna take twice as much time to harvest. And then it's kinda like, okay, but I wanna go sell it at the, at the farmer's market and stuff. Well, replace your petroleum with people. And so you have more people. So get up at 4 a.m., you sleep in an extra hour, but you got more people. Well, up at Wheaton Labs, <laughs> there are people there. And, and so we're experimenting with different kinds of ways to do this. And, and it's kind of like, okay, how do we solve these problems? 
I wish to strongly discourage people from starting a CSA or participating in a farmer's market, mostly because the most successful people in those areas earn generally, usually, less than minimum wage. And I prefer to see permaculture people make a professional wage. I mean, after all, this, this requires a little bit more thinking. You know, I mean, the, the, the guys that are doing the Kim Ag, I mean, they're told by Monsanto what to plant and when to plant it, how to plant it, which equipment to buy, who's the best baker to work with. I mean, they've got a system worked out. And this is a very, very different system. And if you go to an ag school, they, they uh, snicker over the word permaculture. And, and it's unfortunate because there, there are some really wonderful, wonderful, lovely people <coughs> teaching permaculture. And, and it's like, um, but they insist that uh, permaculture includes holding hands and singing songs. <laughs> and I, I love the idea that they're holding hands and singing songs. I just wish they wouldn't say that it has to have that in it. Because Bill Mollison, and the guy that made up the word, has kind of gone on a bit of a rant about these people specifically saying, no, stop saying that. And they keep saying it. So um, then there's a lot of the farmers that have kind of come to the conclusion that yeah, I'm not going to hold hands and sing songs as part of my farming operation. So I guess I'm sticking to Kim Ann. All right. I, I can't even remember what the question was anymore. <laughs> <laughs> growing, growing in polyculture. What's that? Growing in polyculture. It's a good thing Jocelyn's here. <laughs> Making me look good.